We see your screen, Marty. Jeff, you're on. I'm on. We have four attendees. Welcome, everyone. We'll get started in about 45 seconds. Familiar names, including uh, one CEO of the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs from Denver. Mm -hmm. Hello, Arlen. All right, we are live. We'll get started. Um, format's a little different than previously. We're all actually in the same room, though it may not seem like it. We're all sharing a speakerphone. So please do let me know if you can't uh, hear any of us clearly. So again, thank you for uh, joining us um, and taking the time to participate in today's webcast on Stories from the Trenches, the 10 most common mistakes made by life science, healthcare entrepreneurs, and how to best avoid them. My name is Ryan Shankoko with uh, the Physician's Edge, so happy to be here today. And I have the pleasure of introducing our two presenters, Dr. Jeff Hausfeld and Marty Rosendale. We'll start with Marty, just uh, some background here. Marty is the Chief Executive Officer of the Maryland Tech Council, an engineer turned microbiologist and industry leader. Marty's passionate about the human and business value of life sciences, biotech, healthcare, and medical devices. Five times CEO, he hasn't learned yet, <laughs> and twice company founder. His experience spans public, private, not for profit business. We're a big thank you to Marty for joining us today. Very happy to have you. And Dr. H. Dr. Jeff Hausfeld is the chairman and founder of Society of Physician Entrepreneurs, SoapNet.org, as many of you know. Global network focused on educating healthcare and life science professionals. And Jeff is also the chairman of the board of Biofactura, as well as a chief medical officer uh, with the company that with this company that develops its biosimilar platforms and products. Again, a big thank you to Jeff and uh, to Marty for joining us. And before I turn it over to Jeff, folks, uh, quick reminder: we have a lot of capabilities on this platform. Any questions that you have, uh, insert them in the comment section or in the Q&A section. I'll keep an eye on them. Uh, and at about 30 minutes, I'll uh, tee them up for uh, Jeff and Marty to address. Um, and again, uh, please feel free to chat to the host, which is me, with any issues that you have um, as we go through this. And, uh, and that's about it. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. H. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Marty, for joining us today. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs, we are a global, non-for-profit innovation uh, society that really stands at the crossroads of innovation and commercialization of healthcare and life science products and services. With almost 30,000 LinkedIn members worldwide, we try to present the education and connections that entrepreneurs need in order to understand the opportunities as well as the obstacles in commercializing their ideas. And who better to have than someone who has been there and done that before to talk about what are the 10 most common mistakes and how best to avoid them other than someone who has been there and done it before. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Marty Rosendale, our presenter today. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and, and Ryan, thank you for that, that very kind introduction. I, I appreciate it. So um, just a little bit before I, before I get going, first of all, uh, when Jeff asked me to take this topic on, I think I replied to him and said, maybe I can come up with eight, but, but not ten. And then uh, as I dug into it and started to look a little bit deeper, I discovered that not only could I come up with ten, but many of the ten that I did come up with, I could come up with ten more within each of those. Category. So, it, so it turned out to be a, a pretty significant and, and eye-opening opportunity for me. Um, so before I get into the meat of what I'm here to present, um, I, I couldn't resist to talk a little bit about the Maryland Technology Council and, and what we do. So the Maryland Technology Council is the industry association in Maryland that represents both technology and life science companies throughout the state. Now, as you heard from Ryan, my background is in, is in biosciences. I've been a biotechnology CEO. And I'm very passionate about what you all do as innovators and entrepreneurs. In fact, I have this personal belief that in biotechnology, healthcare, and life sciences, um, you may know the statistic, only about two out of 10 companies will succeed. 
But every time one of those companies fails, and it wasn't because the technology failed, that, that failure could be measured in lives. And so I think it's very important that what we're doing here, what SOAP is doing, what the Tech Council is doing to, to help our members succeed, to help our members um, deliver the value that they intended to. So the Maryland, Maryland Life Sciences is one division of the Maryland Technology Council. It makes up 41% of our membership. That's 187 corporate members that represent 10,000 individuals. And we are the state affiliate of BIO. So I want to get into, into the meat of the presentation. But first, in addition to my role at the Maryland Technology Council, I am a partner with Newport CEO Advisors. And our founder, Doug Tatum, uh, wrote a best-selling business book a number of years back uh, called No Man's Land. And the, the concept of this book is so often startup companies it gets to this point where they struggle to grow. And they're, they're kind of at a point in their life cycle where they're too small to be considered big, they're too big to be considered small, and they get stuck. And what Doug found was there, there are four areas that if the company focuses on, they can get out of that, that no man's land valley. Now, interestingly enough, um, I, when I got into this organization, I thought it was going to be different for life science and healthcare companies. But what I found is it's really it's the same. It's the same four areas that are critical and important. But as you'll see as we go along this afternoon, uh, in a much more complicated way in, in healthcare, and, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But those four areas are, are management, so the leadership team, the, the people getting the right people in the right seat, the market, your, your competitors, the, the, the market uh, issue that you're intending to address, the business model, <clears throat> what you're selling, how you're selling it, how you intend to make money, and, and excuse me just a second. And then, of course, the, the money component. And, and that's about raising capital. If you need to raise capital, where is it coming from, and how are you going to address the, the, the capital markets? Now, as I was going through this, um, the reason I bring this up is because I found that each of the 10 items that I selected, and I tried to select the, the 10 that I found to be the, the most common and the most significant, can be fit into these four categories, believe it or not. So, so I, I thought that was interesting. And anybody on the webinar or anybody listening to the webinar that would like to get, to get a copy of Doug's book, if you want to write to me, I can, I can at least send you the, the, the title and let you know where you can pick up a copy because it's, it's a pretty, pretty easy read, but it's, it's fascinating. So, Marty, before you go to the next slide, <clears throat> this reminded me something uh, of something that I wrote when I was still practicing surgery. So for those of you who don't know, I practice otolaryngology and facial plastic and reconstructive surgery. And I said, so I came up with the six M's of medical <laughs> marketing. And the six M's were, what do patients want of their doctors, of their surgeons? They want them to have the mind of Maimonides. They want them to have the mastery of Michelangelo. And they want them to have the magic of Merlin. Especially when you're doing plastic surgery. And you know what? It is the same thing for investors. What they want of entrepreneurs is exactly the same six M's. So now we have uh, 10 M's that we can all look at. <laughs> and you have to follow. Great. Thank Very you. true. And, and for what it's worth, a few years ago I came up with the, with the six P's, but I won't, I won't list them. Uh, so uh, let's see. There we go. Now it's there we go. Now it's forward. Okay. So before I jump in, jump right into it, um, I wanted to let you know where this came from. So as I mentioned, you know, Jeff told me what he wanted the topic to be, and I, I started doing some research. So this came from my own experience in the companies that, that I've been a part of, either as a CEO or, or as, as an executive. It, I, I also circulated it with my partners at the Newport Group because I wanted to get some insight from them, and, and I've got about 65 partners across the country all with, with backgrounds similar to my own. So I circulated, circulated it there. And then in addition, at the Maryland Technology Council, we've been doing a podcast on the capital market. And so I, I took some information from those podcasts because I've been finding that it's, it's been fascinating to listen to, to talk to successful entrepreneurs, successful investors, what's made them successful, what have they done. And, and so much of, about what we're going to be talking about here is, is relevant to investors and, and if you need to be in the capital markets. 
So the first one of the 10 is recruiting the right and relevant leadership team and the key people. Now, at the first bullet point here, I put self-awareness. A number of years ago, I should say actually a number of decades ago, I had a very interesting opportunity to um, work at the American Red Cross at the time Elizabeth Dole was the president. And there was a number of things that I learned from Elizabeth Dole, but there was one thing in particular that I'll never forget, and that was that she was extraordinarily self-aware. She knew what she was good at. She knew what gaps she had. And so she knew what talent to go out and find and surround herself with. And she did a, a tremendous job doing that, built an amazing leadership team around her, and, and as a result was very successful, at least in, in that organization, where, where I had the opportunity to work with her. And I think when you're thinking about a management team, now some of you may be in very early stages and not thinking about that yet, but when you're thinking about a management team, you need to be thinking about those gaps. What are you good at? What do you do well? And what do you need help with? Do you need a, do you need a financial officer? Do you need someone who's, who's more focused on clinical research? It, focus on that. Another point here is so often as a company grows, you outgrow the team that you started with. And that is a very painful point in time for, for any company founder, for any entrepreneur. Because often you have people that, that started with you, that have been there from the beginning, but they just aren't quite the right person to take it forward. And you have to have a tough conversation, and you need to bring in the right people at that point. But it's critical in order to, in order to take, take, take the company forward. And then there's the aspect of governance. Now, again, many of you may be in very small companies, so you're not thinking about a governance board. Um, if you're, if you're mid-stage, mid maybe late startup, you ought to be thinking about the governance board because you can get a lot of, of value out of it. But as you're thinking about it, you need to be thinking about the culture. You need to be thinking about who, you, who you're going to be bringing in, what do they bring to the table, what is their network like, how, how are they going to be able to help you. And I, I would highly recommend, as, as all of my partners would, that even at the earliest stages, you have an advisory board, if not the governance board. So you can, you can bring in that expertise and that additional assistance um, as you need it. And then the last bullet point that I made here is using service providers and advisors. You can't always fill every gap. You're not going to have an on-staff attorney early on. You may not even have an on-staff accountant early on. So you need, you need to be willing and prepared to bring in service providers and advisors, advisors to help fill those gaps. But most importantly, it's important to have the, the right people, the right talent in, in the right seats. And of course, early on, everyone's going to have to wear a lot of hats. Yeah, and choosing those service providers and vendors is sometimes quite difficult and requires some due diligence on the part of the entrepreneur. Absolutely. Again, you, you, you need to make sure they're a good fit. You need to make sure they have the, the right skills <clears throat> and tools that, that you need as an entrepreneur. Now, the next item, and Ryan, I'm having, I'm not sure why. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay. Sorry, a little, little te technical difficulty there for a minute. So the next item is, is raising capital. Now, this is one of those items that, that I could tell you that I could come up with 10 issues under this, this, this one issue. And uh, it's been fascinating in the, the Capital M podcast, the number of things that have come up. And, and we were just talking about leadership and management teams. That, that is one of the, the important aspects of raising capital. But I wanted to focus very specifically in, in, in this bullet point uh, on capital itself. So again, I don't know what stage your company is at, but most early stage companies, you need to be focused on cash. You need to be focused on controlling that cash, managing your overhead, and, and you at least need to know the difference between an income statement and a cash flow statement. Um, that, that's, that's critical. If, if you don't, you need to bring somebody in, get some help, and make sure that you're managing cash properly. But assuming that you're going to need capital, it's critical that you prepare for the capital markets. And markets is all in caps on here. Because most entrepreneurs that, that I run into, that I coach, either don't realize or don't remember that it is a market. And in most cases, if you're not taking on debt, if you're, if you're taking on equity capital, you are in fact selling a piece of your company. 
So you need to prepare, and that preparation uh, means a lot of things. You need to prepare for a diligence room, so you need to make sure your financials are in order, your cap table is, is structured well, you've brought in the right advisors to make, all, make sure all those pieces are in place. But you also need to do the market preparation. What do the investors look like that have invested in companies like yours in the past? Who are those investors? Where are those investors? It's interesting, in the early stages, you're going to get friends and family money, most, most companies do. Angel investors, most likely, are going to come from people that are around you and, and near you. But beyond that stage, you're going, to, you're going to go to other places in the country, most likely, and sometimes other places in the world to raise that capital. So doing the market research, understanding who those investors are that, what, that invest in companies like yours, can also bring you some expertise. Is, is really critical. And, and then there's the, the aspect of promotion. Now, now this is an, an interesting um, point because so often companies come to me and say, well, we've used up our friends and family capital. We've exhausted most of the angel capital that, that we can find. Um, we're going to run out of money on Friday. Let's go meet some investors. <laughs> And, and that's a problem because investors need to know you. They need to have confidence in you. So if they've never heard of you before, it's going to take months to get them to the place where they're ready to invest in what you're doing. So you should be promoting the company, even in the development stages. You should be promoting to investors, making sure they know who you are, what you're doing, why you're doing it, why are you so passionate about this business that you're building. And then the last point that I put on here is you need to have a long-term view. And, and that's, that's critical for anyone of, of a number of reasons. One, that, that early promotion. But you need to be thinking about things like how much of your company are you willing to sell? How much of the company do you want to own when it comes time for you to exit? And not knowing what your exit might be, <clears throat> what do you want to get out of it in, in the long term? And, and the other thing that I hear from, from new companies quite often um, has to do with, usually the conversation comes up in the form of valuation, but they tell me, we need to go raise capital, and a company that looks just like us just raised $100 million on a $900 million valuation. We want to do that. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize that, so, so what I typically do is I either go to PitchBook or Global Data, one of the data sources, and I pull up the history of that company and I show them that company raised $20 million on a $40 million valuation. And then a couple years later, they, they raised $140 million on a $200 million valuation. And, and that gave them the traction and the validation then to go out and do that really big deal. And if you don't have that long-term view, if you're not thinking about that and you're not building that traction, you're going to have trouble when the exit comes. Yeah. So one of the most common mistakes that I've seen in entrepreneurs is that when they finish around the financing, they kind of say, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. Thank goodness. I raised the money. That's it. When you finish around the financing, that is the best time to go out and promote yourself because then you don't need money. Right. And when you don't need money, it's a great time to introduce yourself to potential investors and tell them, I don't need your money now, but I will in six months or a year from now, so let's do this dance, let's get introduced to each other, allow you to do your, your due diligence, so that when I do need money, you know me and you know my company. That's right. That's right, Jeff. And, and the investors love it. The, the investors are so used to, to companies coming to them and saying, I need money Friday that they, they love it when you sit down with them and say, I don't really need money now, but I see that you've invested in companies like us before, and I'd love to tell you about what we're doing and why it's so important. And, and so that, that's a, a fantastic point. Okay, the next, the next bullet point here is focus. Now, for many of you, if you're a physician, if you're a scientist, you're, you're building a company, it's very easy to get unfocused, especially if what you have is a platform of some kind that, that can take on many, many different forms. It creates too many priorities. It creates distractions instead of traction. 
and, and what you need it, what you need is traction. And so often I hear from mostly scientific founders. Um, scientists tend to be you know, very focused on the, the data and the, and the science and the, and the development, and they're afraid they're going to miss an opportunity. Mm -hmm. They're afraid that the product that they're going to deliver is not going to be that perfect product, or they're going to miss an indication. And so they just, they just keep researching, and they keep researching, and they, and they never take it through the development process. So there's a concept out there it's called minimum viable product, and it's, it's particularly important if you're developing a, a medical device or, or something uh, of that nature. Design something that is viable in the marketplace, but doesn't necessarily have all the bells and whistles, but something you can get to market, deliver some traction, get people excited, and, and get it out there. Investors will appreciate it, customers will appreciate it, the marketplace, the healthcare system, everybody will appreciate that approach, and then you've got something to build on at that point. You can start adding to it, you can start enhancing it. So Marty, yesterday I was sitting with my uh, CEO, Daryl Sampi of Biofactura, and we're looking at this uh, new uh, technology of, a, of an antibody that can bind to four different epitopes at once, and we're talking about different ways of doing the assay for the ELISAs and he's showing, you know, different conjugates of different antibodies. And, the, and he basically said, the science is fun, but let's get her done. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I wish I would have put that one on my slide. There you go. That would have been perfect. <laughs> All right. Moving on. So... So this is one of those areas I, I mentioned that you know the four the four M's and how they apply even to, to healthcare businesses. But this is one of those areas in, as far as the business model that adds a degree of complexity that you don't see in in most businesses. But it's it's absolutely important. Now most people when they see this slide or or hear me say this they think FDA. I'm talking about the FDA. And I am talking about the FDA. But it's not just the FDA. Within the FDA, it's important to know who you're going to be working with, which division, and, and what their requirements are going to be. But as you're looking forward, depending on where you're, where you're going to sell that product, how you're going to sell that product, you not, might need to be concerned about state boards of pharmacy. You might need to be concerned about the n notified body in the, in the EU or, or other country uh, regulatory bodies. And, and you need to make sure that you've got all that figured out and, and laid out. Again, it's, it's important for, for the development and to make sure that the commercialization goes smoothly. It's also important to investors. And, uh, and I can tell you one, one of my experiences, I was running a, a small public biotech company, and um, I got particularly frustrated one afternoon and decided to punish myself even further. And so I sat down and started counting how many regulatory authorities I had to report to that had the right to audit my company at any time. And when I got to 70, I stopped. <laughs> and those are financial regulators, health regulators, um, pharmacy regulators. I mean, it, it, was a, it was a big mix. Now, not everyone deals with that. We were, we were distributing the product in, in every state, so I had to deal with 50 boards of pharmacy. So I'm being a little bit unfair. But, but nonetheless, it's a big number, and it's important to know what that regulatory world looks like. And then, of course, the last bullet point here, once again, is there are a lot of expert advisors in this space um, that you should tap into. Okay. So clinical utility and relevance. This one, this, this one um, I, ha I have another experience here that I'll, I'll describe in just a minute, but it is so important that you define the buyer profile, that you understand who's going to be buying the product, and then you get out and talk to them. I don't know if you're familiar with the i model, but, but i is a program that helps entrepreneurs, helps train entrepreneurs in, in, the, in the startup and early development stages. And one of the things that I really, really like about their platform is they force you to identify who your customers are likely to be and then before their, the program is over, you have to get out there and talk to over 100 of them right. and, and come back and, and understand exactly what they're going to be looking for. And that, and that is so important. But in the healthcare space, it's also it's important to understand how, how is your product going to change behavior. And, and, and here's the example that, that, that I'll throw out. I, I had a client 
uh, I guess it was about 10, 10, 10 years or so ago. And they had developed a really cool technology that allowed them to measure the degree to which a patient was immunosuppressed. So they could, they could quantify the amount of immunosuppression. Now, the, now the, the founder and CEO at the time had a long background in history in, in HIV and AIDS. And, and so they were taking that product into that market, into the HIV AIDS marketplace. When I came in, I started talking to those customers. And without a doubt, every one of them loved this technology. It was cool science. Mm -hmm. But there was nothing they could do with it. There was no therapy. There was nothing that they could do that, that, that with this information other than to think, wow, it's really cool that I know that. Right. And so what we did was we took it into transplantation. Because now you've got a situation where it's artificial immunosuppression and you can control it, and you have this balance that you need to strike between rejection and, and, and infection. And in that situation, it was phenomenal, because now we could quantify the degree of immunosuppression, and the physician could make decisions about the immunosuppression mm -hmm. regimen. And, and so when I'm talking about clinical utility and relevance, this is what I'm talking about, is make sure that what you're developing is going to have that kind of impact. Yeah, and there are some DCs now that will only accept entrepreneurs that have been through the i -Corps program or something similar to it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because because it, it, it is a phenomenal program. Jeff, Marty, I'll add something to that. Um, kind of building the buyer profile, as, a, as many you know, I'm a content marketing strategist. This helps you build your, um, your buyer narrative later on, especially when you're doing a lot of digital marketing for your B2C clients or even your B2B client, being able to build kind of your uh, funnel marketing pipeline by identifying the buyer profile earlier on, mm -hmm. doing that due diligence, you know, at the right stage as opposed to later when you realize, oh, now I need to start marketing now. Mm -hmm. Right. And so this is very good practice. Yeah. It would be interesting to see, because I know it happens a lot, how many i graduates pivoted during the i -Corps program, because I know, I know many of them do, because of this exercise. <clears throat> so the next point, having a defined purpose and, and identifying an unmet need. Now, this is a little bit redundant, but the first bullet point up, I put up here is why. And as, a, as an old sales executive, I think this is one of the most important questions that you have to ask yourself, because it drives passion. Why are you doing this? What is it about what you're doing that has you so excited and passionate? Because you need to communicate that to others, whether it's customers, partners, employees, investors, you need to be able to communicate that. And that passion, that purpose, that will help you drive focus. Because if you really understand why you're doing it, it'll, it'll help keep you really focused. But then on a more fundamental level, you need to, you need to make sure that there's a need. So if there's no one that needs, if you've identified something that maybe you've struggled with but others haven't, then there may not be an unmet need in the market. So what, what problem are you addressing that others have? And then you'll need to get proof. You'll need to have something, it'll, when, you're, when you're out there trying to sell, sell the company, sell the vision, talking to investors once again, you'll need some proof of that unmet need. Who else has this problem? And, and what's the current practice? So what's it going to look like when this when this rolls out? How disruptive is it going to be? And, dis and disruption can be a good thing. So course. this was this was one of the major tenants that caused us to to create soap mm -hmm. more than a decade ago, was that we saw amongst life science and healthcare entrepreneurs that they didn't understand unmet need. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand. They had a great idea. They, they had terrific science, but they didn't know where to use it or if. If the end user would actually use it, right. So the physician was the one who said, "I know it's in my toolkit. I know what I need. I know what my patients need." That's how we started to to get the doctor or the healthcare provider in the mix of entrepreneurship, but at the same time teach them the road to, to if they have an idea themselves. It's not the same as doing medicine. It's right. a very different project, and you have to be able to invite all these people into this big tent. So it takes it takes a village to make this happen. You right. know that, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, one one thing one thing that I hear is that often is some, is some form of if the rest of the world only knew what I know, they'd be lined <laughs> up at my door. 
<laughs> and that, that isn't always the case, clearly. All right, product market fit. So this is, this is uh, similar to the topic that we were just talking, on, talking about, but this is about how will, how will it be used, who's going to be using it, and will it be familiar? And, and that, that familiarity aspect is critical because if it's too disruptive, you're going to have trouble commercializing it. <clears throat> I think I just got two minutes. two minutes signal. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. <laughs> the business model. I'm sure most of you would like to make some money at what you're doing. No. So the question here, <laughs> the question here is, is how are you going to make money? What does your business model look like? How are you going to charge for it? Who are you going to charge for it? Who's going to pay for it? What does the reimbursement look like? Is it going to be patients? Is it going to be payers? Um, again, that's a critical aspect in the healthcare marketplace, whether you need or want strategic partners. And, and probably one of the most important bullet points, and this comes back to raising capital, make sure your forecasting is real, your market estimates are real, and, uh, and your positioning is real because investors will uncover all of that. And you know that pro forma is really Latin for wrong numbers. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. <clears throat> so managing risk, um, I just realized that I've got a typo on this slide. Um, managing risk, again, this is probably intuitive. You need to make sure you're identifying and monitoring risks. Uh, legal risks uh, often are, are relatively apparent. Intellectual property risks, not so much. You need to understand your intellectual property position. How well protected are you? How likely is it that someone else is going to be able to come in and do what you do or change it in a little way? And I, I, I remember uh, my father was a serial entrepreneur in injection molding. That's how I was an engineer before I was a microbiologist. And uh, he had a client. And this client made a huge business out of doing nothing more than taking other people's products, changing them a little bit, and putting them back in the market. <laughs> and, and so that intellectual property is so critical, and it's a risk factor that, that others will be looking at. It's important to take risks. You're, you're an entrepreneur after all, but I recommend that you take measured risks and that you mitigate risk through market traction, validation, using advisors, and, and, and others. And the last point here, um, and this, this comes from my work at the Tech Council, you've got to stay connected. And this can be so hard to do. This is one of the purposes behind SOAP, and certainly one of the purposes behind the Maryland Technology Council. How do we help entrepreneurs, innovators stay connected? How do we make sure that you're talking with your peers, you're staying abreast of what's happening in the field? You're, you're talking to potential mentors. You're, you're learning um, what's available to you out there. What is the government doing in far as providing incentives? What are the economic development organizations at your state, city, county level? What, is, what are they providing you? And you can learn all these things through networking opportunities, through staying connected. But as I said, it can be really challenging. It's so easy to put your head down and, and forget about this aspect of running a business. And so make sure that you belong to peer groups. SOAP is great. Make sure if you're, if, you're not, if you're in Maryland, join the Maryland Technology Council. If you're not in Maryland, join the life science organization in your state. But it's really critical to stay connected and, and stay abreast of what's happening out there. Marty, thank you so much. Your, your words are, are pearls, and I hope that they will be uh, absorbed and, and reflected on by the audience. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email us. Yep. Uh, we're happy to to engage and answer your questions. All right, I've got some live questions here, and a uh, few I got actually an email, and some I came up with on my own. Um, uh, let's start with this. What are the biggest mistakes you can make when approaching big device with your idea or invention? So by big device, I, I assume you mean large companies, not large medical device companies. Well, you know, a lot of that is very similar to how you approach the capital markets. In, in fact, if you're looking for a transaction, it is a capital markets transaction. And so when you approach big device, understand, first of all, they're going to be really smart about your market. So make sure you're really smart about your market. You know where the device, what the device is going to do for the market, who's going to buy it, all of the things that we just talked about, how it's going to be used, how disruptive will it be, Make sure that you understand those things in, inside and out because, because the big device company that you're talking to will understand it. 
and they need to have confidence in you. They need to have confidence in the, in the management team. So, much, so many of these transactions are based more on the team and confidence in that team than the, than the product itself. It's important that you, that you drive that confidence. And be careful about the timing of when you present to big pharma or big device companies. You don't want to make it too early, and you don't want to make it too late. Right, right, absolutely. Uh, this one's for the both of you. Um, a lot of great advice on promoting your business to investors, especially when you don't need money. It's, uh, uh, I thought that was a great piece of advice. What are some tactics from a tactical perspective that uh, business owners should be doing when promoting businesses um, in order to win investors, what are some of the most effective things that you've seen out there? I'll turn it to either one of you to start. Go ahead. You first, Jeff. So, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of business development as well as raising capital for, for a variety of different companies that I'm involved with, whether it's the memory care facilities that, that I own and operate in the Midwest or whether it's for Biofactory here in Maryland. And there's a process that I call kissing frogs. <laughs> where you have to, you know, go to these meetings and you have to meet all of these people that you know are not going to be investing in your company, but yet you still feel obligated and uh, the need to talk to them, to let them know your story, and to let them hear about what your plans are. From that group of hundreds, hundreds of potential investors, you may get 1% to 5% that actually are interested in investing. But it takes a long time. It's a very long dance, and you have to celebrate when you get you know, people that are really so interested in you that they're willing to write a check. When that happens, though, always remember your fiduciary responsibility that you're dealing with other people's money. Spend it like it's your own. It's great advice, Jeff. And, and, and I, I absolutely, absolutely agree. Um, I can't tell you how many investor meetings um, I've had and, and how many roadshows I've been on where you're doing back-to-back -back investor, investor uh, presentations. I think if you think about the numbers that your typical institutional investor will see, um, a fund that's, say, $500 billion to a $1 billion fund will typically talk to about 5,000 companies a year, meet with 500, and invest in five. So it's, it's tremendously competitive. And, and, and the more that you can stand out, the more that you can focus on, on those investors that, that are interested in you, the better. So as Jeff was saying, you, you get out there, you meet with a lot of them. That 1% or half percent or what, whatever it is that have expressed interest, stay in touch with them. Don't meet them once and then, and then go back when you need money. Send them press releases. Send them an, an update on, on what you've been doing. If you if you've hit a milestone, absolutely tell them about that. Keep them apprised so that when you do go back, they'll say, wow, this company has a track record, and, mm -hmm. and that's something I'm willing to invest in. Right. That's absolutely great. Thanks so much, guys. Um, I've got one more left, uh, and you mentioned um, exit strategy. And so I've met, as, as I'm sure you guys have met thousands, hundreds of entrepreneurs, uh, uh, startup CEOs that never think about the exit strategy. Mm -hmm. First question is, should they? <laughs> Second is, how much should they be thinking about that when they're looking to approach investors? So if we could close out with that question. Well, they, that has to be something they really have to understand and understand really well because an investor may like you, an investor may like the science, an investor may invest in you because they have a, a, a spirit of, uh, you know, giving back to the community and impact investing. But still, at the end of the day, 99.9% .9 of investors want to see a return on their investment, and they want to know that you have a plan to get them that return. So if you go in with, a, with the, that hope is my strategy, <laughs> it will not fly. You have to have a very direct path as to what are the potential ways that I can return your investment with a profit? And, and I, I agree with that. When, when, I, when I go into an investor, and I'm talking about exit strategy, the, the first thing I say, and I think this is important, is I'm not building the company based on an exit. 
And the reason that that's important is because that will put you in a bad situation when the exit, when the exit comes. When you get a, a transaction opportunity or, or a buyout, if you've been building the company to that end, you probably haven't built as much value in it as you might otherwise have done. So that, that's the first point. But secondly, you can't not think about it because Jeff's absolutely right. The investor wants to know, how am I going to get my return? That's, why, that's, that's the main reason I'm doing this. I'm managing other people's money. So, so how am I going to return for them? How am I going to be successful in the eyes of my investors? And, and they're going to want to know that you're thinking about it. They're going to want to know that you've looked at comps. What have other companies in the space done? How have they exited? What do those exits look like? And, and if you've got some really good comps, that gets them excited. They want to know that you're prepared. They want to know that you understand the evolution uh, of a company as it's building towards an exit. And, and so all of that is important. But it's just as important, if not more important, that you're not building the company to an exit, that you're focused on building a solid business and a solid company. All right. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. I want to thank uh, Marty Rosendale, Dr. H, for joining us. Uh, thanks so much, guys, for such wonderful content, very applicable, I'm sure, to our audience here, a lot of value add. Uh, this is fun, as always. Um, we will send out a recording of this webinar within 48 hours, um, and I'll go ahead and uh, insert, uh, Marty, your email address in case anyone's curious about uh, your work. Uh, All right, and yeah, that's fine. Info email. Okay, I'll go ahead and send that out to our our attendees as well as our registrants, uh, along with additional information about uh, SoapNet.org. And uh, with that, we bid you all farewell and hope you join us again soon. Thanks again, Great. Jeff Martin. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Cheers.